That's how our sky looks like at the moment. Isn't that amazing? And this morning it was super cloudy, so this situation here is only here for the last one hour or so. Before that it was absolutely cloudy, which is good for me, right? Because our garage solar, I mean, it pumped in with five kilowatt today and I could recharge the battery to over 60% right now. <laughs> I mean, that is crazy. So we've got now 4 p.m. And we can see it's still making 700 watts here from our tilt system on top of the house, 4.2 kilowatt hours only because we had cloudy weather. But again, this is the deal we have. The tilt system is for sunshine in winter. The garage solar is for clouds in winter. And they're both working hand in hand. Guys, welcome back to another video here from the off -grid garage in sunny Australia. It is sunny. Yeah, 60%. And I made today 15.6 kilowatt hours here from the garage, the carport and the big shed <laughs> in cloudy conditions. I cannot get over this. This is just amazing. This is really good. And then on top of that, the 4.2 kilowatt hours from the tilt system now, almost 20 kilowatt hours. Perfect. But this is not our concern today. In this afternoon's video, I want to share something with you I'm working on for the last... Uh, probably two months or so. And as you know, I'm getting a lot of emails and people always asking me, Andy, what kind of BMS should I buy? What is the best BMS? What BMS has the best features? What features has this BMS in comparison to the other BMS? Which one should I buy? And of course, this all depends a bit what kind of system you have designed, of how much solar have you got, how much load have you got, how large are your batteries, how many batteries do you have. So all this needs to be taken into account. We cannot just say this BMS is the best and fits all. And usually my standard reply is then, well, I've made so many videos about BMSs and tested everything in all details. So just watch the videos and then you've got all the knowledge to make the decision yourself. While this is true, it is a lot of work to watch all these videos and extract all this information about the different BMSs. So what I have done now is I have actually started a spreadsheet and started comparing all the BMSs. But... When I say all the BMSs, I'm not talking about the consumer grade BMSs like a DALI or a JBD or a JK BMS. Because these BMSs are very straightforward in what they can do and how they work. I am talking about the more industrial BMSs like the Seplos BMS, the Pace BMS, the Google Power BMS, the Tangaluma BMS in the QSO battery. All these larger here, here, here. All these all these larger BMSs which have more functionality, more safety with the current limiter we can see here, the communication ports, the relays and dry contacts. So these are a bit better designed here to actually cope with parallel batteries with larger systems. You probably want to go with such a BMS instead of a DALI BMS or a JBD or a JK BMS. And because these industrial style BMSs have so many features which are not documented in the specifications or in the manual, I have started making this spreadsheet I'm going to show you right now. And while this information is in all of my videos, as I said, it is a bit hard to extract. So I have started this spreadsheet now to collect all this information in one spot and make it a bit comparable. So show you actually what the BMSs can do, how they work, what the benefits are, what the features are and what I like and what I dislike in these BMSs. OK, uh, without further ado, let's get right into it. So and here's the spreadsheet called BMS Comparison. It's a very unspectacular title, but it has some good information in there. And even I'm using it all the time now with testing these BMSs because I cannot remember what kind of settings I need to change to make something work. So let's go quickly through it. In the columns, I have the different BMSs. As you can see, I've got four different Seplos BMS tested. And then we've got the Tangaluma BMS, the Pace BMS, and also the Google Power BMS so far. And I will add more BMSs down the track. So first of all, we've got a model number here so we can identify the BMS, what I have tested here in the off-grid garage. The next two columns are pretty new, so I haven't put anything in there, but I want to link the specifications of each of the BMSs either to the manufacturer's website or to one of the PDFs out there. So one click on here, you've got all the specifications of this BMS because all the parameters, all the settings I'm comparing here are mostly not in the specifications of this BMS. 
So I'm not testing here for a maximum current or for maximum voltage and maximum balance current, these things. No, I'm testing for parameters and settings which are not documented in the manual. Now you will see in a minute what I mean. And also in the next row, I have the software which you need on your computer to talk to the BMS to change the settings if it doesn't have Bluetooth. Then of course we have the firmware tested because there are slight differences between different firmwares and BMSs. We've got the external communication. So usually this is CAN or RS485. This is the communication from your BMS to your inverter or to the Victron system, for example. The parallel communication to other batteries. If you have more than one battery or more than one BMS, you can parallel these batteries and the BMSs will talk to each other or well, they should talk to each other. And this is all done via RS-485. I haven't come across any other communication standard than RS-485 so far. Bluetooth access, some BMSs have Bluetooth, some others don't. The PC communication is either RS-485 or RS-232. Some BMSs can do both, some can only do RS-485. The switching line means is the BMS disconnecting the positive or the negative of your battery if it disconnects in case of an over voltage or over temperature over current situation. Most BMSs switch the negative, but the Seplos BMS used to switch the positive. Well, in the brand new Seplos BMS version three, it, they also switch the negative now. More about this BMS in the next video. We have the BMS sensitivity. You cannot find this information in the manual or specifications of the BMS. And here, for example, you can see the, the Tangaluma BMS needs 1.6 amps to actually start working. Everything under 1.6 amps, it doesn't count for that. So if you charge the Tangaluma BMS or your battery with only one amp, it, it doesn't register that at all. It shows zero. While the Pace BMS has a sensitivity of 0.5 amps only. Then all of these BMSs have a current limiter built in. So they either limit the current to 10 amps or 20 amps under certain circumstances, which I mentioned here. What is the trigger for this current limit? Yeah. Is it overcurrent alarm or is it the overcurrent protection or anything else? You find the information here. Also, can you turn on this current limiter manually? In the Seplos BMS, you can. And then it charges only with 10 amps. Why would you do that? Well, this is for testing and maintenance and troubleshooting purposes. If something is not quite working, you may not want to test it with 150 amps or so. So you can actually limit that. Not all of the BMSs can limit this manually though. Then we've got something which I am still a bit on the fence. What is actually the problem here? But does the BMS actually show the DC load in the Victron VIM and adds this load to the consumption? It shows the DC load, but it doesn't calculate the energy this DC load uses to your overall consumption. It only registered AC load, but not the DC load. The Seplos BMS does it. Yeah, all the Seplos BMSs, they do it absolutely correctly. If I have DC load or AC load, both will be added to my overall consumption. But the Tangaluma, the Pace or the Google Power BMS don't do it. Then we've got another criteria here in regards to the Victron VRM. Does the BMS actually report the single cell voltages? And I think here the Seplos BMS, they actually show the single cell voltages in the Victron VRM, but I haven't fully tested this yet. That's why these fields are playing at the moment. It is a work in progress. It is not finalized yet and probably it will never be finalized because I will always add more information to this spreadsheet over time shows the consumed ampere hours in the Victron VRM. None of the BMSs tested so far do that actually. So I think this feature is only available with Victron gear like the Victron Smart Shunt or the Victron Battery Monitor, the BV, BV, um, BVM, the BVM, what it says here. So only when these devices are connected, it shows the consumed ampere hours in the VRM. I added this here in the spreadsheet because I have talked to several uh, BMS manufacturers now, if they can include this as well when they talk back to the Victron system. So let's see, maybe with the next firmware update, it will work. And then we have a yes here for one of the BMSs. Then of course, one of the main things is the CVL, the CCL and the DCL. So this is the um, charge voltage limit. How far do you charge? So the BMS tells your inverter or the Victron system, your MPPT, how far you should charge. The charge current limit, 
how fast it can charge, and the discharge current limit, how fast it can discharge. And we know from the Zeploss BMS, it took us quite a while to find out how we have to change the settings in the BMS to actually report a certain value to your inverter then. I've got all the information here for all the BMSs I have tested. Different firmwares have different settings. So this is a total mess across all the BMSs. Then the next two are the full charge triggers. There's one full charge voltage trigger and one full charge current trigger, like a tail current. The Zeppelin BMS, for example, they don't have a tail current. They only have an over voltage protection we need to reach to actually then fully charge the battery. So the battery is then considered to be fully charged. Other BMSs like the Tangaluma have a constant pack voltage, so we don't need to tap into any protection situation then. The same with the Pace BMS. They've got a pack full charge voltage and a pack full charge current. If both of them are met, then the battery is fully charged. And here another very important point, when is the BMS showing 100% state of charge? And here again, the Zeppelin BMS is terrible because it needs an over voltage protection. It needs actually to run the BMS into a protection. We need to exceed 3.65 volts or a pack over voltage of 58.4 volts until the BMS shows 100% state of charge. Totally wrong. I'm trying to convince them since the beginning to change this in their software, but so far, well, we will see if the version 3 of their BMS can deliver it. Yep, the Pace BMS, for example, has the pack full charge voltage and the pack full charge current, then the battery is fully charged and it resets to 100% state of charge as well. This is perfect. This is how it should be. So then we have the MPPT status when fully charged, or it could even be the MPPT slash inverter status when fully charged. Some BMSs leave the inverter or MPPT turned on, so it can actually still deliver power directly from your solar panels through the MPPT or inverter to your load without tapping into the battery. Some other BMSs don't allow that and set the MPPT to zero. So it turns it off and then all your load will be supplied by the battery only. Even we still have sun outside, which could be potentially a big waste of energy. The same what happens with the charge MOSFETs in your BMS when the battery is fully charged. So the charge MOSFET status is something most BMSs turn off when they are fully charged. I'm not a big fan of that because we should only disconnect the BMS if there's an over voltage or over current or over temperature protection to stop further charging. But if we only reach the charge voltage, we should not disconnect or turn off the, the charge MOSFETs in my opinion. Multiple protection levels, over voltage protection one, over voltage protection two. Some BMSs have multiple levels. I have explained this in one of the recent videos as well. There are certain escalation stages you can program in your BMS. So first of all, you stop charging at 3.6 volts. If it goes to 3.65 volts, you get an alarm. And then if you, if you hit 3.7 volts or something, the siren goes on. So with um, Node Red or Home Assistant, for example, you can read these protection levels and escalations and trigger a certain action then. Yeah, Zeplos BMS has only one level. Other BMSs have multiple levels in different format. You find the information here. Does the BMS have a power switch? Well, I think we can say all the BMSs have a power switch. Even some of them don't come with a power switch, but there is actually a connector on the PCB. With the Zeploss BMS, for example, we can connect one and we have to enable the power switch in the uh, switch function, in the function switches, and then it will just work like in all the other BMSs. Do we have a low state of charge and a high state of charge disconnect? Here again, the step loss BMS gives you the option to disconnect your battery at say 5% and at 90%. If you are one of these people who are afraid of degradation of your lithium ion phosphate batteries and you only want to charge your battery to 90%, these BMSs can do it. They stop at a state of charge, not at a voltage level then. So again here, some BMSs give you the option to program that. Some of them have only an alarm and some of them have nothing like this at all. And the last two rows here are about the logging in the BMS. We either have a history logging or a live logging. History logging means it actually locks automatically in the background and you can read this information later on. So if you have a fault in the middle of the night, for example, you can read what has happened in the morning by going through all your log files from the last night. Live logging means 
you can only read what is happening right now. And the BMS shows you this on the screen. Some BMSs do have both. Some have only one. Some of them have nothing like this at all. I haven't fully tested all the BMSs yet here. There are still some gaps in this spreadsheet, but I will fill them in over time. And then last but not least, there is a notes field as well. And I'm just putting information in here which don't fit any of the other categories here. Doing a bit of a sum up, what other options and features I have found during my testing, for example. And again here, more information is coming over time. Okay, my friends, this is all I have for today. I just wanted to show you this spreadsheet I have started working on. I'm sharing this now um, on my website. I link this down below under the video as well. So if you, if you need any information about a certain of these industrial style BMSs, and hopefully over time, this will be more and more complete and we're adding more information than for everyone. And when the next emails are coming in, I can just tell them to look at this spreadsheet here, read through all the information, all the data, and then pick the BMS. It suits them most. All right, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for all your great support to all these wonderful and beautiful people who are donating to the channel. This is very much appreciated. Thank you very much. And until the next video, guys, when we do something completely different again, you may have seen the crane already in the background here. We will do some more crane action. And I hope this will be an amazing system I'm going to show you then. Until then, guys, you stay charged, stay safe, and thanks again for watching. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>